Well, I am so glad that you're here this morning. If you brought your Bibles, which I hope you did, please turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. At the end of this service, we get the opportunity to meet some new members. Brother Park right now has them in new member orientation. Um, and let me, as your pastor, just thank you guys for a great weekend. Uh, y'all have been outstanding. We had a Valentine's banquet on uh, Friday night and just had a marvelous time. Our, our youth are so talented. I'm telling you, they did a fantastic job. And the volunteers, it was one of the, it was just really, really great. It was great. And we had a fantastic time. And then uh, last night, the many volunteers that helped put together the, the Big Daddy Weave concert, this place was absolutely packed out, amen? And it was exciting, and it was a great worship experience. And, and the people from the Big Daddy Weave uh, people, they, they said, listen, this is one of the best venues we've ever had. You guys were phenomenal. They were so helpful. They've never felt more at home, and it just really turned out great. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you. We also ministered to families that were losing loved ones, and, and uh, you just stepped up to the plate, and you did a great job, and I appreciate it. Some things that we got coming up, make plans to attend the marriage conference. We've got that information out in the foyer, uh, Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. If you have not yet signed up, I would encourage you to. You can sign up online, or you can sign up out there in the foyer. If you need daycare, you need to let them know that you're going to be needing child care during the conference itself, okay? And that's March the 8th and 9th. Tonight, there will be a very short, quick deacons meeting in the lighthouse at 530. Uh, brother uh, Randy Dingler, our chairman of deacons, and, and Brother Brent need to share something with you. I promise you it's really good news. It's good stuff. But they need to meet with our deacons at 530 in the lighthouse, please. So make plans for that. And then uh, to let you know, uh, I have not left yet. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Uh, I will leave this afternoon, and we will go to Dallas and uh, get ready to catch a flight early in the morning. We'll have to be at the airport about 430 or 5 and fly out at 7 o'clock. And we will leave from here to go to Atlanta, Georgia. From Atlanta, Georgia, we'll go to Narita Airport in Tokyo, Japan. From Japan, we'll fly down to Manila in the Philippines, and then from the Manila to Tenjai City. So it's about a good 24 hours flying, traveling uh, for us. I, I would covet your prayers for my pilot, um, whoever that might be. You just pray he stays healthy and that all is well with the pilot and the co-pilot that are going to be flying my airplane across the Pacific Ocean. Um, so, uh, we are really excited. Thank you so much for your support and for allowing us to go over and do this. And uh, I know tonight we have services at 6 o'clock, Brother Park's going to be preaching. We got, I got some great preachers lined up for you guys, and I know you're going to enjoy it. Uh, hopefully you don't enjoy it so much you don't want me back, but uh, they, we've got some really, really great preachers coming up. So, please support those guys, okay? Uh, if you would, please stand in honor of God's Word. We're in Acts chapter 9, and now the focus really begins to turn and point toward the Apostle Paul. His conversion is in Acts 9, of how he gets saved and, and uh, turns his life over to Christ. We're going to start that this morning. And if indeed our premise is true, that this is a defense brief written by Luke for his trial, for Paul's trial in Rome then it's only natural that we begin to now turn toward Saul of Tarsus or the Apostle Paul, okay? So now we're going to look at verse 1, Acts 9, 1. And Saul, or Paul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way or Christianity, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee 
what thou must do. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? God, I pray that this morning as your Holy Spirit begins to deal with our hearts, that God, our answer to you would be, Lord, what would thou have me to do? God, I'm listening. My heart is open. God, whatever you want me to do, I pray that I would do it as your disciple and you being my Lord, I will be obedient to you. Oh, God, we are a room full of sinners desperately in need of a marvelous Savior. And God, you are that Savior. And we cheerfully recognize your unseen presence. We're thrilled that you have chosen to join with us today. And I pray that everything we do from our songs, to the way we gave, to the way we respond. will be a glory and an honor to you. God, may we please you this morning. Because that, that's our goal, just to please you. For it's in Jesus' wonderful, precious name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to give you a little bit of background on the Apostle Paul. Understanding this that Paul's Hebrew name is Saul. We know that, Saul of Tarsus. It literally, in the Hebrew, means ask for. He was named after the first king of Israel, King Saul, and we know that's his Hebrew name, amen? After he gets saved, the Bible changes, and it begins to call him Paul, the apostle Paul. Paul is his Roman name, and it means little because he was small in stature. For, for the sake of confusion, I'm going to just call him Paul, okay? And y'all may go, but he saw, I, I know that, I know. But I'm not going to say Saul, who is Paul, or Paul, who is Saul, throughout the whole sermon. So it's Paul. Are you with me? Thank you. The early childhood of a Jewish boy pretty well went like this, according to Jewish writers in the early first and second centuries, that a young Jewish boy would begin his study of the, of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, when he reached the age of five. So when he was five, he began to learn to read and to write so that he could study those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He wanted to be able to study the first five books of the Torah, okay? At the age of 10, he would begin a study of Jewish law and the traditions of his father and go through the Proverbs and the Psalms and the prophets and begin to learn those traditions that go with the law. At the age of 13, a young boy would become bar mitzvah, a son of the commandments, at which time he took upon himself the full weight of the law and became a member of the covenant people. He was looked upon as an adult. If he were a promising student at the age of 13 or 14, he would be directed to a rabbinical school under a more professional teacher if he exercised great promise as a student. During his childhood, a Jewish boy would also be taught a trade or how to work hard. It is said that if a father did not teach his son to work, then he was teaching him to steal. So Paul learned to make and to repair tents as his livelihood. And everywhere he went, that's what he did to earn the support so that he could go on these mission trips. The overall goal of raising a young boy was not to raise intellectuals incapable of being able to work or function outside the realm of academics. In other words, they didn't want a bunch of little egghead intellectuals that did not know how to work. It's okay, we want you to be smart, but we want you to also know how to work. But at the same time, they did not want to raise a society of uneducated clods. So they were educated, but they also practically knew how to work. Concerning Paul specifically, a second century writer recorded that Paul was short in stature, bow-legged from possibly as many beatings, and bald-headed with a ready smile and a pleasure to be around. <clears throat> And just not bow-legged. His own description said he bore the marks of Jesus, which were possibly the scars from being persecuted, from being whipped, beaten, and stoned. We also believe he had some type of a body ailment, a physical ailment, a thorn in the flesh is what he called it, caused by a messenger from Satan 
And he asked God to remove it no less than three times. Some people say, Brother Sam, let me tell you, if you got the faith, God will heal you. No, that's not true. That didn't happen in Paul's case. Paul had a physical ailment. It was called a thorn in the flesh. He asked God no less than three times, God, would you please remove this from me? And God said, no, but I will give you the grace to stand it. And many believe that he got it simply to keep him humble because otherwise he was so talented, so smart, so full of God that he would have gotten arrogant with his knowledge if he didn't have some type of of a thorn in the flesh. Some believe it may have been an eye ailment that he literally could not see very well. He was almost going blind. That could have been one, one, one idea because he wrote, I believe, to the book of Galatians, you see what large handwriting I write in. You know it's me because he was writing in large handwriting, which would you, do, you would do if you couldn't see very well. He wouldn't write in small handwriting. Some believe it was a malarial condition that caused extreme headaches every time he got near the Mediterranean Sea or he got down to sea level, and it caused just debilitating migraine headaches. We, we just simply don't know what it is. His hometown was Tarsus, which made him a Hellenistic Jew. He was one of the Hellenistic Jews that was debating with Stephen just prior to Stephen being stoned. He probably lived from the age of 18, I mean, from the age of 14, and either went to the University of Antioch, which was a great university town, or possibly he moved to Jerusalem to further his studies of the tutorial skills of a preeminent rabbi, and most likely Gamaliel, who, is, who he studied under. And it's like he got an earned doctorate academically. Scholars have surmised that he may have lived with his married sister to finish his education. Because in Acts 23, 16, the Bible says, and when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. So we know Paul had a sister. She was married and had a son. So Paul had a nephew. Okay? And he probably lived with them while he was finishing his education. We know that Paul is from the tribe of Benjamin. We know he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And on the fast track for making himself known and a great name among the Jews. So the question is, was he married? Ah, that's a good question, okay? I don't believe so, even though in the second century A.D., it seems to be a member of the Sanhedrin, a requirement was to be married and to have children, but we're not sure if that requirement stood at the time of Jesus or at the time of the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 says this, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So we know at the time he wrote to the church at Corinth, he was not married. So whether he became a widower or whether he actually had been deserted by his wife, we do not know. But at this time, he was not married. He was single and remained single to the end of his life. An idea I don't want you to neglect, though, as we, as we go through the life of Paul. Paul was a city boy, okay? He did not come from a rural background. And much of his writings can be told that he was a city boy. He was born a Roman citizen, which means that his father was a Roman citizen. And that means that he was born into privilege and probably came from a middle to higher middle class family that had some bit of wealth, okay? So now we go to chapter 9, and we start looking at uh, the outline that I have, okay? And it begins us to pick, gives us a picture of a man that is filled with hatred. A very real hatred. So look at Acts 9, 1 through 2. And yet Saul, Paul, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way of Christianity, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Let me tell you something. This says that Paul hated the Jews that had converted to Christianity. It was his belief at the time that the so-called sect of Christians who were a perversion of Judaism had to be cleared up in order to pave the way for the true Messiah to come. So literally, Paul thought he was on a righteous uh, uh, quest to destroy Christianity so that the true Messiah would finally show up. In other words, he was righteously angry. He thought he was doing God a favor by destroying Christianity. In his testimony before King Agrippa, 
This is what Paul wrote in Acts 26. He said, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priest, I caused many believers to be sent to prison. I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down to foreign cities. I think it would be fair to say that the Apostle Paul hated Christians' guts. Excuse my vernacular. So my first point is this. A hate-filled heart filled with anger and hatred is a great indication that you're living in the flesh. You're here today and you're mad. Somebody done you dirty. They took something that didn't belong to them. You said something you didn't say, I'll get you, man. And you got anger in your heart or some type of a bitterness and it occupies you about how dirty they done you and what rotten scoundrels they are and, and you've got unforgiveness and revenge and conflict in your heart. I tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, you're living in the flesh. Your flesh is ruling you. And either you are a very carnal Christian or you're a lost person, one of the two. But if you are filled with that anger and bitterness, you are living according to the flesh. And let me tell you, because it's going to do two things to you, okay? First of all, first of all, the first thing is you're hurting yourself. Jesus said, it's tough for you to kick against those pricks, isn't it? So what he's talking about are, if, if you were a farmer and you were going to plow a field, and you had a couple of oxen that were kind of cantankerous, you would sharpen some sticks, and you would aim it at their hindquarters so that if they decided to buck or kick backwards, they were going to kick sharp sticks. The only person they were hurting was themselves by kicking. It's like that child that gets angry and says, I'm so mad, and kicks the curb. Well, who'd you hurt? You hurt yourself, dummy. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. In other words, if, if you're living in the flesh, this is a, a manifestation of your life. Adultery, fornication or pornography, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft or pharmacia, drug abuse, hatred, variance. Emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envy, murder. In other words, you're always eat up with somebody. Ah, I'm so mad at somebody. Harboring hatred in your heart is strengthening the carnal nature inside you. You simply feed it. And you forfeit the true fruit of the Spirit of being able to love and experience joy and peace. Listen to what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesians in Ephesians 4. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. But let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. In other words, the Bible says this, when you are filled with anger, when you are filled with hatred, when you've got revenge on your heart, you are grieving the Holy Spirit. You're breaking God's heart. And you're only hurting yourself. The Bible says, if I let bitterness get established in my heart, it's like a root that affects everything and everyone around me. And that bitterness begins to spread from me to my children, to my children's children, and it will be passed down to all generations. And you can oftentimes see it. Just move from one generation into the next. Listen, the Bible says if I've got anger and bitterness in my heart, if I'm angry at my wife and, boy, she's done something just made me mad, the Bible says it hinders my prayer life. I can't pray like I'm supposed to be praying. And I'll tell you, God forbid that I should try to put a sermon together because it does not work if there's conflict between me and Karen. The Bible says if you come to church and, and you're going to give an offering to God and there you remember you have all against your brother, stop. Lay down a gift, go, get it right with your brother, and then come back and offer a gift to God. Because it affects your worship if you have anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and revenge in your heart. Instead of being a blessing to my surroundings, I become a defilement. The only commandment I've got, the greatest commandment, is love God, love people. Most of them, you don't know what they die. They nail you to a cross. 
Because Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know what they do. The Bible says, love those that hate you. Bless those that curse you. That's what our master told us to do. Paul tells the Colossians, quit acting like lost people. And he says in Colossians 3, 8, now put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication. He says, you ought to peel it off of you like your, get, like your jacket's caught fire. Get it off. Get rid of it. Lay it down. You are not intended to carry that burden. Get that anger out of your heart. Get that filthiness out of there. Because you're only hurting yourself. Until you come to a point of forgiveness. forgiveness. Second, when you get angry at somebody else, you empower your enemy. The person you're angry at, you're giving them the power of your heart. So let's say, for instance, Brother Park stole my popsicle. I had a cherry popsicle in the freezer in the break room, and Brother Park came and got it and stole it and ate my popsicle. And I'm mad as horn. I think, you know, I'll get you. One day I'm going to steal your popsicle. One day I'm going to find you. And, man, I'm going to get you for stealing, you popsicle stealer. And I'm just angry. And every time I see him, boy, it just builds it up again. I just get madder and madder and madder. But what I've really done is I've given the keys of my heart to Brother Park. I've given my enemy control over my heart. You need to take control and choose to forgive and start the healing process. Let me tell you something. Paul was a very, very angry man. Let me me tell you all this. This is my quote, okay? And you can write it down. I I would suggest that you do. You ready? Okay. You can write it down because I'm saying it. Get this. If I'm angry at you, if I hate your guts, it's like I'm taking poison and expecting you to get sick. How dumb is that? I'm taking the poison. It's hurting me, and I'm expecting you to get sick. The person who was the real loser in this deal was the Apostle Paul. Man, he was angry. He was threatening and bitter and just, that's what consumed his life instead of the joy of God. But second point, Paul had a very, very real encounter with Jesus. Amen. Up until this time, Paul thought that Jesus of Nazareth was a fraud. He was nothing but a pretender, a fake Messiah, until Paul had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Look at the scripture with me, verse 3. And as he journeyed, as, 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 as Paul journeyed, let me tell you something. Damascus was 150 miles away from Jerusalem. It was a long road. That's how angry he was. Brother, I'm telling you, I'm going to be mad if i got to walk 150 miles to do something. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. He'd already gone about 140 of those miles. And suddenly there shone around about him a light from heaven. Uh, During this trip from Jerusalem up to Damascus, uh, he had to go through a land called the Galilee. This, This is where Jesus did most of his miracles. Now, Paul was a Pharisee, and, and, and he took with him some temple guards, but he was so arrogant and proud, he wouldn't even talk to them. I mean, he, he, he wouldn't have anything to do with them. They were beneath him. So he just basically walked by himself. But now he's walking through the place where Jesus left the biggest thumbprint. And don't you know there are people going, <laughs> I, I was blind, but now I see. I was there when he took a handful of food and he fed 15,000 people. Maybe the gathering demoniac came up and said, I'm the one. I had a legion of demons in my heart, and he got rid of them. I'm free. I'm alive because of Jesus. Someone say, I saw him walk on water. Someone say, I was crippled. I, I had leprosy, and I'm clean. And you could not help seeing the thumbprint of Jesus Christ all throughout the land of the Galilee. And he had to go through this. And you know in his heart of hearts, he's going, man, what is this? What is this? And he gets to the outside of Damascus. And he's probably thinking, what would cause these crazy people to be willing to die like Stephen for their faith? And suddenly Jesus appeared in his glorified state. 
And Paul was confronted with a power much greater than him. Literally, the Shekinah glory of Almighty God came down, and immediately the Bible says that Paul prostrated himself flat on his face in the presence of God. When I was a child, I, I, I had an anger. Boy, I'd get mad. And my brother knew exactly what buttons to push on me. Boy, I'd get red in the face and tears would come to my eyes and I'd grit my teeth. And, and he was about 15 months older than me. But I'm telling you, man, I'd, I'd, I'd want to just, uh, just attack him. Until my dad walked in. <laughs> a power greater than myself. And I, and I think nothing could get rid of I'm so angry. I said, so, man, I just choked your life out. Man, yes, you kicked me out of bed once too many times. You, done, you stole things off my plate. I, I just, I'm so mad. And said, Dad, I love him. I love him. <laughs> Dad, you can put your belt back on now. He, he, he's my best friend. I love him to death. And see, here's old Paul, just angry, man. He's mad, and, and he's mad. And then Jesus shows up, and boom, flat on his face. And he knows he's in the presence of Almighty God. He's been overwhelmed by the presence of Almighty God. The Bible says he fell to the earth. He heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the word for Lord here is curios. It means God. He says, who art thou, God? Who are you, supreme one in authority? Is literally what the word curios is. Now get this because it's so, so rich. And the Lord said, curios said, I am. Stop. Ego emi. Same thing that Jehovah God said to Moses at the burning bush. Whom should I say to Pharaoh sent me? You tell him the I am sent you. And, and, and he could have very easily said, who, who are you, Lord? He said, Jesus. Knucklehead. But that's not what he did. He said, I am. Ego emi, I am. The proper name for Almighty God. I am is who I am. That's who's talking to you. It's amazing because in John chapter 8, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I said to you, before Abraham was, I am. And the Bible says they took up stones to cast at him. They knew exactly what he was saying. Ego in me, before Abraham was, I am. They said, you're claiming to be God. He said, you got that right. And they were going to stone him for blasphemy, for claiming to be God. Now Jesus speaks to Paul on the Damascus Road. And he says, who art thou, Lord? He says, I am the I am. Joshua. Jesus. Suddenly he's going, oh, man. The Jesus of the New Testament is Jehovah of the Old Testament. And suddenly it hits him. And he's overwhelmed that he is in the very presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let me tell you something, dear friend. If you were simply overwhelmed by the church you attended as a child, if you were overwhelmed by the preacher or by the music or by the songs or the seats or something like that, you need to be overwhelmed by Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the commander of the Lord's army, Jehovah Shabbat. You need to acquaint yourself with Jehovah Yiri, the God who provides, Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. You need to understand who you're dealing with. You're dealing with the one that spoke the worlds into existence. I don't care what the scientists have to say. My Bible says God spoke and the worlds came into being. Woo. You're not dealing with some religious relic. You're not dealing with somebody that has no power. The Bible says all authority and power in heaven and earth is given unto him. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus, Jesus is the Lord God of all. High and above. Whoa, boom. And that's who he was overwhelmed by. And that's when the apostle Paul got saved. So what was Paul's very real response? The Bible says in verse 6, And he trembling and astonished, blown away, overwhelmed, said, Lord, what would you have me to do? He submitted himself to the authority of God. All right, what you want me to do? I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And he submitted himself, lock, stock, and barrel, 
So the question comes, can God change a heart? Can God change a heart of an individual that's full of anger and bitterness and, and, and that is content to murder Christians? He said, every time we had a capital tr uh, trial come up, I voted kill them, stone them. I was not just held to, 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 to arresting men. I got men, women, and children. I tried to trick them into blaspheming. And if I could, then we could stone them. I was the enemy. Everybody was terrified of me. They all left Jerusalem because of me. And when they left Jerusalem, I went looking for them. And even years later, when Paul came back to Jerusalem, they were still scared of him. That's how bad he was. Can God turn a heart? Sure he can. My Bible says our God holds the heart of a king in his hand. And if God can turn a king's heart, he can turn Paul's heart. If he can turn Paul's heart, he can turn your heart. And he can turn my heart. Let me tell you something, dear friend. You came here today and you had a heart full of anger. Somebody's done you wrong. Somebody's hurt your feelings. Somebody's stolen from you. They've taken something from you. They've broken your spirit. I want to tell you something. You need to lay it down. You lay it down. You were not intended to carry that with you. That's why in just a moment we're going to have a big old altar call. Because I believe God can change your heart. But you can't be overwhelmed by me. And you can't be overwhelmed by the church. You've got to be overwhelmed by Jesus and his desire to heal you. 1725, John Newton was born. He went to sea with his father at the age of 11 and began to work his way up through the ranks on a slave trading uh, ship where they would go over to Africa and they would buy slaves and then they would take them over to the New World and there they would sell them and they would come back with their profits. And uh, he, he was wicked. And, and he was a self-professed, very wicked man. He said, listen, in business, I was extremely wicked. He said, brother, there were revolts on, on the ship where the blacks would try to to revolt and take over the ship. He said, so I, I would put them down the hold, and, and, and in the hold, if they made any noise, I'd put thumb screws on them to keep them quiet, and then I would have muskets and cannon trained down onto them and say, move, and I'll kill you. And he didn't mind if, if, if over half of his cargo oftentimes died. He literally had no conscience about having human cargo. He went over to Africa at one time, and he got captured by some other folks that were slavers, and, and, and history records that John Newton was actually put into a cage and because of malnutrition began to go blind. He could not see. They put him into a cage and put him in a carnival. His job with wild hair, beard grown out, blind. That when people came by, he was to shake the bars and bark at people. Ha, 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 ha. Like a human wild man. That was his job in the carnival. Finally, another fellow captain came and saw him there and rescued him and got him out and got him back on board a ship and, 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 and got some nutrition into him where his eyes got better. He was so mean, one time he fell overboard. And instead of his, his sailors throwing him a life preserver, they harpooned him and drug him back on board the ship. But that's mean, isn't it? He worked his way back up to captain, was the captain of a sailing ship of, for slavery. And a great storm came and hit their ship one night. He thought he was going to die. He was scared. And he had a very real encounter with Jesus Christ and gave his heart to Christ. He said, God, would you forgive me? Would you wash me? God began to work on his heart. And he eventually said, listen, I can't do this slave stuff anymore. And in fact, he had such an impact on Wilberforce, who was one of the greatest abolitionists to ever live. Wilberforce got his influence through John Newton. John Newton surrendered to the ministry, became a pastor, became a minister, and wrote one of the most beloved songs of all time. That makes more sense to you. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers and toils and snares I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Dear friend, I want to tell you today, God loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross so that your heart could be changed. 
If God can change a man like John Newton, if God can change a man like Saul of Tarsus, he can change a man like you. But you've got to be willing to let go. You've got to be willing to come down and say, listen, I, I, I don't want that old bitterness in my life anymore. That stuff passed down from my grandfather to my father to me, it's time for me to break the curse. I don't want it in my family. I don't want my children angry. I don't want my grandchildren growing up angry. It's time to lay it down. If God can love me, I can learn to love somebody else. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Billy's going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. God, you didn't come to, 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 to patch up an old wineskin. You, you came to change us. And God, I pray that that anger and that bitterness and unforgiveness will have no part in that new creature in Christ. Oh, God, please, open our hearts. Those hidden chambers that we've, we've hidden away for so long, God, would you open those up? And God, give us the ability to forgive. And, and God, even if we're not ready to forgive, would you at least bring us to the altar and say, God, give me the want to. Give me the want to to forgive them. Because if they knew Jesus, certainly they wouldn't have done that. Oh, God, teach us to love, and we will give you glory and praise. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Guys, this morning we're going to have what's called an invitation. It's an opportunity for you to respond if God's spoken to your heart. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, Brother Sam, the truth is I am a Christian. I have given my heart to Jesus Christ. But I've let some anger creep in there. It seems like bitterness is just slowly starting to spread. And it's not just spreading to me. It's also going to my wife and to my children. And the truth is, it's hurting me. It's hurting my testimony and my prayer life. And the person I'm mad at probably doesn't even know I'm mad at. That's why we built this big old altar down here. It's just a great place for Christians to come and say, no more. No more. I'm I'm not giving you control over my heart anymore. I lay it down. And I'm not going to come pick it back up. Nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to get you to fill out little cards. It's just a great place to get some things right with God today. Maybe you're here today and you say, Brother Sam, we've been looking for a church home. And, 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 and we're not perfect. Well, I tell you, friend, we're not per- perfect either, amen. We're a church full of sinners. In fact, if you are perfect, don't join us because we'll mess you up. But if you want to join with us and help us to reach our community with the beautiful message that Jesus Christ overwhelms, that Jesus Christ forgives, and this church is going to love you, we'd love to have you. More than anything, have you given your heart to Jesus? Are you sure you're saved? I didn't say were you overwhelmed by the church. Were you overwhelmed by Jesus? Have you had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ where you prostrated yourself and said, Lord, what will you have me to do? What will you have me to do? I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Have you met my Jesus? So I'm going to ask you to stand. We've got decision counselors down here at the front. If you'd like to join the church or be saved, well, I would encourage you to come to one of these decision counselors. They would be glad to pray with you and answer any of your questions. Church, I need you to be praying now as we begin to sing. Would you come? The altar's open as we sing. You come. You come. You have always called my name. You have waited patiently. 